Yes. And, and what other else may come up? Okay, all right, we'll see. We, we haven't had the greatest luck with this camera recording, and I'm planning on getting a new one, but it's so hard to figure out what to buy with these camcorders. So, all right, anyway, it's all yours. Okay, cool. Yeah, so tech directed search with dependent types. So the first part there, tech directed search. How many guys have, have heard of Google here? All right, cool. So I heard of it because you said it. <laughs> so for those of you who haven't, like, well, if you brought your computer, like, bring it out, steal the Wi-Fi, and go play around with it. So it's like Google.Haskell.org, and it's a really cool idea. It's it's this idea that in Haskell, types tell you a lot, and um, so what you do in in Google is you search by a type signature, and it's. It's like Google, it's the name, right? But, <laughs> but for types, and it's, so it ends up being really neat because um, let's say I'm looking to sort a list. I type word A, a list of A to list of A, and it's gonna be one of the top results because essentially very few other functions would even have that type signature. Um, sort does. Uh, so that's the first part. So I'm going to be talking about type directed search. And then that second part with dependent types. So I've been looking into doing search for a dependently typed language, which is, is very cool because essentially we're going to take, so Idris, which is the language I'm going to talk about, takes Haskell's type system and expands upon it. Essentially, right in Haskell, you have values and your values, the, you know, the things which you actually play with all have types. And then types are this sort of restricted language that you can't do much with, right? There's all these restrictions in Haskell to make sure like type checking actually finishes, things like that. And then types even, right? Because you need to make sure you're doing your type checking correctly. So you need to have kinds that describe the types. And, and there's this whole hierarchy. I think it gets up to sorts, like they just have, they're eventually going to run out of words that don't really mean anything, but kind of mean like type. <laughs> but in interest, it's much different because you have values and types. And essentially, there's a whole cumulative hierarchy of types. Um, but the, So they're all just considered types. And the, the cool thing is that values can now appear in your types, which just changes everything. It changes the game. Um, and so I should probably get started. So, so here's the overview. First, I'm going to talk about type systems. And so hopefully give you some motivation to say why Idris's type system is really going to tell us a lot about the programs that we're writing and why that's cool and important. Uh, so then we'll talk about code and type search, and at least why I think that's a cool area to think about. Um, and then I'm going to talk about equality and isomorphism. So I'm going to talk about properties of types. And, and to me, those are the key things that you want to search about. And so I'll discuss. There, there's a lot of interesting stuff about equality and isomorphism in these dependently type languages. And then finally, I'll get to the weird stuff that I actually did that's in the compiler. So that's, that's the colon search feature if you have your Idris REPL running, which no one does here. <laughs> Okay, so I don't think this will be too controversial in the placement of the languages here. Python necessarily it has a useless type system because it has no types. That's um, not like unitype, right? Is that the Robert Harper? Unitype, <laughs> absolutely. It has one type, which is not very helpful. Um, C's got types, but they're kind of annoying and. And I think that's why people go to Python, because they see C and they say, oh, these type things are awful. <laughs> Let's just give up and, and, and just forget about them entirely. Ooh, oh, I have a title. OK. <laughs> um, wonder where Go fits on that. Probably right next to C. <laughs> probably, well, it's got generics, right? So you should have like job, 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 job there, there too. It, the point is not to fight over this. So then we get to ML. <laughs> so ML is kind of the, the granddaddy of, of the, the ones below it uh, in terms of type systems. So that is, has the Hindley Milner type, yeah, type system, which is a very 
it sits at a really satisfying place in the type system world in that it's pretty simple, but it can do a, a heck of a lot. Haskell. So, so I'm going to claim that there's actually kind of a big jump between these two languages, and that's going to have to do with the, the type defects that Haskell has. And then finally, Idris and Agda, which are two languages that have dependent types, and so their type systems are even more useful. All right, so Python. Yeah, it's just, you, you can't do anything statically, and that's sort of the point of it. You can redefine functions, and, and th there's really no structure until you actually run things. So you can't, so the good thing is, compared to a language like C or Java, it feels a little more flexible, but the bad thing is that you, in order to know what the code's gonna do, you kinda have to run it. Okay, so C. What's the worst thing that a function can do that takes a void star and returns a void star? Because if you work with C, right, everyone knows that void star is just like data. It's the, it's like the only type that doesn't make any sense. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> so it's the most common one of all, right? If you, your lists and queues all take void stars. And so here's what I thought of the worst thing a function like that could do. <laughs> so this is clearly the identity function. Um, <laughs> because it, it takes something a void star and returns something a void star. So on the way, we're just going to overwrite our input. Then <laughs> we're going to overwrite the area of the address in the stack. So that, that you know, if I, when I run this program, it, it just crashes. Uh, <laughs> before, before we can change the global random state and return a random memory address. So, so Maybe it's kind of good that it crashes early. All right, ML has a very much Haskell-like uh, type system, uh, but it doesn't have type defects. So, so here I'm gonna say I can be only one thing. But anyone want to say want to suggest why that's not really true? What else? So a, a function which takes a generic type, just we don't even know what it is, a type A, and returns a type A. And so we say, oh, it must be the identity, right? Bottom. Well, that's even a problem in Haskell, so I, I've saved that issue for the, the next slide. Um, <laughs> but a difference that you can't have, something you can't have in Haskell, but you can have in ML. So it's a, it's a little tricky because the return thing that we're going to do, we're still, we are kind of forced to return what we were given. But in the meantime, we can do whatever we want. We can launch nuclear missiles. We can order pizza. We can do evil. Um, and that's because ML doesn't have typed effects. And so, so the types, in some sense, don't, they don't actually represent what they're doing. They're, they're missing a piece of, of it. Um, all right, so now we get to Haskell. And in a pure language with typed effects, I could, now it's got to only be one thing, right? And, and this, this definition almost looks good, right? I, it, is, it is the identity. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but, but this is essentially, this is the infinite loop of Haskell, right? We're saying, OK, if you want to evaluate I, oh, just, just use the thing on the right. And that's, that's I, OK. so. So I see the thing on the right, and I say, OK, I need to see what i is. So I go back to the left side of the equation, and over and over. And so this thing never terminates. So unfortunately, we have the right type, and Haskell's happy to type check this for us. But it is not what we actually want. OK, here we are at Idris. And so Idris has this little total specifier thing that says, I want this function to be total. And so what total means is that it can't end in an error, and it also can't go on forever. It's got to finish. It's got to return a value. And again, like Haskell, it just has typed effects. So the only thing, the absolute only thing you can do if you have this type signature is to be the identity. OK. So, so we just saw. Just in this one example of this kind of type that we saw as we go through those programming languages, 
that we restrict what is specified by those types as we go on. And so, so the way I kind of like to think of it is that there, there are two things we can like about programming languages. One is what you can do, and one is what you can know. And it's kind of easy to move this way along the space. Because, <laughs> right, you can start maybe here, like I can know a lot, but I can't do anything, right? If I can't do anything, I know exactly what my programming language does. It does nothing. <laughs> so, so what you can know is almost like what you can't do. But I think really the goal that, that we should have with our programming languages is to move that way. Right, to be able to both do more and know more. And so, um, right, so maybe we'd say something that like uh, Java, Java I think is pretty good on the what you can know part, but people get frustrated at what you can do. Um, and so these, are, these aren't like formal notions and right, they're Turing equivalents and all that, but these are just kind of rough notions of what we think. And then maybe with Python, we more moved over here. We can do a lot more, but we don't know anything. And I think Haskell, in a way, gets the best of both worlds. It feels like a scripting language. Types are inferred, all that stuff. But when you look at the types, they can actually tell you a whole lot. And so the, the goal with Idris, I think, is probably to get something over here, right? To know a lot and do a lot. Okay, so now we're going to talk about one of the things that I think makes Haskell really special. Um, if you talk about C and you want to say, what does a C program mean? You, you have to think that you're a computer. You have to think of memory. You, right, C doesn't make sense. It, it's assignments and everything. It doesn't really make sense outside of the computing world to think of an assembler and to think of a processor. Um, and on the other hand, I think Haskell was really the first language to be focused on having a, a really simple denotational semantics. And so we'll see what, I, I'm going to go into more of what that means. So operational is kind of like, to understand what this language means, you have to essentially be a computer and, and run the things that you see. Uh, but denotational semantics are a little simpler, and I think it's more, it's really more human oriented. And so I think if, if you're doing operational semantics, the, how are you going to do your development? Well, test-driven development makes sense because that's how you understand what your programming language means. You kind of have to run things, or you have to run them abstractly. In, in some sense, you have to run them. But now, I think denotational semantics allows you to have type-driven development. And so, um, okay, I guess first I'm just going to... Wait, can you go back real quick? Did you... Uh, oh, okay, no, that's, that's yeah, the same. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, all right, I thought you were... Um, so why don't I not... Do I not really like test-driven development? These aren't real arguments, but they're fun, so... <laughs> <laughs> like, this is not actually going to convince you, oh, in my job I shouldn't be doing this, but <laughs> but, but just to, to show that there, there's a little more out there, here's a Stack Overflow page that I really like, and it's about patterns in math that eventually fail, and just some of them are really funny. By the way, if you guys have questions, like, uh, tell me, interrupt me, there's not many of us, so I'm happy to be take me on like a half hour tangent, that would be awesome. <laughs> how long is your talk? I have no idea. Okay. I haven't given it. <laughs> I was adding to it in the minutes before we started. Um, here's a cool one. So this is using the sync function, which being that I've been doing a lot of signal processing lately, this is actually important to, well, it's relevant to me it feels a little bit. And so we see this pattern. Uh, the math isn't that important, but, but we see, okay, this is pi over 2, this is pi over 2, right? So we see, you know, 1 over 1, 1 third, 1 fifth, all the way up to 1 thirteenth. They're all pi over 2. And then once we add in this one extra factor, 1 over 15th, we get this ridiculously <laughs> close number to pi over 2. It's like almost <laughs> pi over 2, but it's not. 
And it's just, it's, right, it's like, these are not, it wasn't like it was rounding error that got these to pi over 2. These are exactly pi over 2. This one is not. <laughs> and so the, there is an explanation to it, uh, as one guy in the comments points out, is that it's the first time that the sum of those, those numbers there exceeds 2. Um, but you look at the pattern, and who, who would ever expect that? <laughs> It, this is a funny expression. I don't know who came up with it, but... Um, By Ramanujan. <laughs> well, I guess it says there, but I don't know oh, okay. who they are and, and what they are spending their lives on. But um, So apparently that number, this is a whole number to half a billion, at least half a billion digits. So it's not quite a whole number, but it's really close. <laughs> Um, there's another good one about, ah, this one takes too much explanation. Things eventually fail, like, and, and so tests are never going to satisfy me. <laughs> what, was, what was the topic of this, of this Stack Overflow? Examples of apparent oh, patterns that eventually <laughs> fail. Interesting. Okay, cool. All right. And so what about termination checking, right? Like if you're running a test, maybe you see it takes a while. And it's like, what's the point where you say, oh, I mean, this must not be terminating as opposed to, oh, let's wait a little bit longer. Um, and so I thought like, I mean, this is also very stupid, but, but it's a fun thing. There's this fun thing called the busy beaver function. And it says essentially, if I have a Turing machine that has most, at most this many rules, if the Turing machine terminates, it's going to do so in at most this many steps. So what that means is, if I have a Turing machine, say that has four rules, I can run it for 108 steps. And if it, has, if it is still running after 108 steps, then it, we know it's not terminating. And so this is just shows you that that's not a good strategy. <laughs> <laughs> that by the time you get even very simple Turing machines can go really long time and then stop. Um, but, so the thing about these event patterns that fail, uh, termination checking, we get these with types, and, and that's really cool. Uh, so let's get started with some of this operational stuff. Um, that's, that sounds like a winner. Okay, so there's this really cool thing, which is in Haskell, right? We know that if we have, so I don't want to confuse you with what equality means here, but in, in some pretty nice sense, we know that this is the case, right? And so just the types of these expressions are both going to be, uh, well, let's say we have f is of type a to b. Ah, no, f is b to c. g is of type a to b. And so these expressions are list of a to list of c. Does everyone understand this? Because this is kind of key. Cool. All right, so we're just mapping functions over lists and combining them. And this is huge, right? In the Haskell compiler, this equality is important, unlike any other language, because it optimizes things using cool properties like this. If you write this on the left-hand side, that iterates over a list twice, and it kind of produces an intermediate list in the middle, right? Um, this one's a lot nicer. You only have to iterate over it once. Um, and in Haskell, it does the same thing. Um, uh, just because it's been a while, um, the dot yeah. notation, uh, if you were writing it out like by hand as a math function, would actually be applying g then f, right? Or is it applying? So f, f dot g, mm -hmm. we can, I have the definition actually right here. Uh, so that's, that's the same as f dot g x. So I have my g's and f's a little backwards from how you normally do it, but, uh, the dot follows in the same way that you would write math. Oh, okay. 
So G's applied first, then F, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, so Haskell will optimize this for you. It'll it'll do the thing on the right, and like you can't do that in ML. If you do that in ML, you break the program. Um, but Haskell has that. This is what I think the key of the the denotational semantics. So what do I even mean by this? What do I mean by equal? So we're going. Let's. I want to prove this, essentially. Um, and so, so here are our definitions of map and composition, which will be important to us. And so how do we prove things? Essentially, I shouldn't really say this, but I should say apply it to any list. So this applied to a list X's should be the same as this applied to a list X's. That's what I mean uh, for all X's of type list of A's, right? And this is, but I'm not even caring even though the result types here are list of C's, I'm not talking about like an equality operator. Like it doesn't need to be in the E class. We can really still talk about this stuff, even if they're functions, even if they're things we can't compare for equality. All right, so let's do the proof. How do we prove something about a list? Well, a list is either the empty list or it's something followed by a list, right? So what about the case of the empty list? <laughs> This is kind of dumb, right? So I'm just writing like reduction steps on each line here. And obviously, if anything makes any sense in the world, if you feed it the empty list, it gives you the empty list back. And so I've just computed by hand, right? We don't need to imagine a computer. We don't need to have memory slots and things like that. We just, we just literally follow the substitution patterns that are given here. I just mechanically do that. And we get the empty list and the empty list. So there's the empty list. And now the case is, what if we have an element followed by a list? That's the only other possibility. All right, so let's actually follow this through. So first I'm just going to, and let me know if, if any of these steps is like not clear to you, tell me. I just see a bunch of maps and G's and F's up there. I'm <laughs> <laughs> kind of, kind of, a little dizzy right now. So. <laughs> uh, uh, stupid question, but so at line 41, yep. where you have, so essentially there's some associativity built in here, so that means I ins is the dot of map f, map g applied first, and then that, that the result of that is applied to? Is yes, so function association in Haskell is always to the left. So if this is really, we associate that. Okay. And then we associate that, and then we're done. Okay. So, and then the, the dot, the infix dot operator, you're just rewriting. Yeah, I just reposition that. Yeah, so because really that that kind of allows me to more mechanically say, oh, look, I need to expand the that's definition just, of dot. You're just sort of deshoring that. Is that correct? Yep, exactly. And I'm gonna get rid of that there. So. All right, so what did I do in this step? Someone tell me, at least. 33? 31 to 33, 30. what did I do? How do I know that 33 is the next thing after 31? Apply 23. Just apply 23. Yeah, exactly, right. I just apply that. I just fill in what I have my F and G and X, and it's very mechanical, and I get this. And so I just keep going. Um, now I can, well, so is that sometimes. You're, so you're associating, mm -hmm. at, the, at that point, are you associating that? Is that, I mean, is that like? Well, I'm, I'm just reducing this entire expression. So this is yeah. dot with three arguments. And here I have dot with three arguments. So I can replace them. And the cool thing about Haskell's semantics in general is that if I have two terms that are kind of both out there, I can reduce one or the other, and it doesn't really matter which order I do. They're, they're independent until they get combined. Um, here, that doesn't really matter so much. Uh, but are you are you for the dot? So the dot is the composition of the two functions, right? Right. And so in that step, you're saying I'm taking this, these two composed functions, and then I'm turning the g of x into an expression and, a, and 
So the thing about, I think out. maybe the thing is, you, you say, well, why don't I expand one of these things first? No, no, I was just trying to clarify. I mean, so essentially what you're doing is you're saying, the sort of the step is you're saying, okay, well, the, the, what you're defining there is you're defining, you're defining a composition of two functions on f, right? Is that on the, on the right side on 23? Yes, is this saying. is a definition and, of dot. Yeah, and then, just and then there you're saying, thing. okay, now I'm creating an expression that's g of x and then passing that into f of x, is that? So... I mean, you're sort of rewriting the composition to in a, in a different form, is that? Yeah, so I'm just applying the definition of dot. What does dot mean? Okay. Right. Dot means that I apply this to, to this, and then I apply this. So I'm just... I'm just yeah, so first, so you're applying the G to X, and then the next step would be to apply the well, X. Well, in this, right, this G. I'm applying this G, which here is a map G. Right, 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 yeah. Okay. And so then I get this, and so now I say, right, the step here, I'm choosing, I have map now has two arguments applied, so I can just use this map. And so here, we use our pattern matching, right, and we say, oh, I got to go to the one on the bottom. Uh, and so again, it's just just a mechanical replacement, and I get this. And now I can do mechanical replacement of the outer part, and I get this. Okay, and I'm kind of happy where I am here, because I have an element, and now I'm following that up with... Uh, essentially... Oh, I missed one kind of step that I could do here. I can unapply things as well, right? So I can say, I can go backwards, right? And I can say that this is map f dot map g x's, right? I can go forwards or backwards. It still means the same thing. I'm kind of, I'm a little further from where I am to compute this down to, to a usable form. I'm going back up, but, but I want to do this because now this looks exactly like what I started with. And so you should have some feeling that we need to do induction here. So I'm just going to leave it here that I evaluated one element of the list, and now I'm left with this. So I'm sorry, how'd you get from 35 to 37? Uh, that's just applying the definition of map. Oh, oh okay. Uh, this On one here. Oh, okay. So here's the definition. Mm -hmm. So I do f of the function and then map of the rest. All right, now here's the other way. It actually turns out to be a little simpler. Uh, I just apply my map. So I just reduce this thing here. And that becomes this. And then I'm just going to reduce the left-hand side. And so we see those first elements that are the same. F of GX, we don't need to know like what their well, types are. They don't need to be able to be compared for equality. They are the same. Um, but then you say, okay, well now I need to compare the rest. And here's where you can say, oh, well by induction, maybe I already assumed that they were equal. Or the way I like to think of it is you just make another recursive call to what you were doing, right? And you know eventually if your list is, so Haskell allows infinite lists, right? And then this kind of breaks down. <laughs> but forgetting infinite lists, eventually you'll get down to the base case where you'll do the thing that I deleted and put somewhere. Nope, just deleted. <laughs> um, and so eventually you'll have proven that you get the exact same results. So like, this is something you can prove. And it's something important, it's in GHC, used for optimization, and I think there's really, there's nothing better. And so I want to convince you that this would not work in ML. <laughs> But, but in Haskell, right? This is a Haskell uh, group. So I wrote this little program here. And essentially, we have typed it effects, but I'm just doing, so ha have you guys seen this function before from Haskell? Fish function. One, a anyone else have seen it? So this is like a monadic version of composition. So it's like the dot operator, but it's for, um, these monadic operations. Um, right, so this looks like, you know, if you, you squint, it's B to C to A to B to A to C. So if you squint, it looks like 
it looks like function composition. But it's 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 the monad monadic thing. So really, I do we all have a sense of how this is defined? We can define it if we want. Do you guys? Let, let's do the show of hands thing. Should we define this right here? Or do we have an understanding of what this is going to do? I don't know what's going on, but yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't have to do it for me. <laughs> yeah? I, 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 don't, don't, I don't either. So. No clue. If you can define it, that'd be great. <laughs> I think that's a... Okay. Go for it. <laughs> so if you guys are familiar with bind, it's, it's sort of, well, we're really bound uh, to know what this thing is going to do. Uh, okay. So my x, let's just get the type straight a little here. f is b to mc. G. By the way, how do you read the fish? What do you usually call it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> fish is a great name. What's it called? Yeah. Scala Kleisley arrows. Oh, Kleisley. Uh, okay. I've heard of iteratable iterates and stuff. The stream right. functioning. Wait, what was that one? In the, in the Scala iterates, they have those same operators for. Is like, it the same thing as Kleisley arrows? Kleisley is what the word is? Yeah, yeah. Kleisley arrows. That's what it's called? Well, that's what it's called. Have yeah, you heard of so, I don't so know if that's like, but I don't know if that's the same thing now. In Clojure, there's a Swiss arrow library where there's like a whole family <laughs> of these. It's like the arrows. <laughs> yeah, this, this is, I think, probably a category theory thing, I'm guessing. In my opinion, they should have lost three characters. Yeah, so it's operators. like precisely a category. All right, so the thing here, all right, let, let's start doing something. We know, you can just look at the types and, and you can almost understand that there's only, almost, there's like one thing you, you can do. And let's, I'm going to give us another thing here, which is going to help us. And like with this, uh, right, so that's bind. For, for these should all be monad m things. All right, so with these four types, you should be able to define this on your own without knowing anything, because like the types tell you a lot. They tell you a lot, and mm -hmm. there's like only one thing you can do. So does someone want to start? Let's do this. What am I going to do with my x? G to X. G to X. Cool. So let's just keep track of this. G X has what type? M B. Awesome. All right. We're getting there. suggestive. So we're going to type our thing and then, <laughs> then type the G and... Uh, oh, the, the bind? Yeah. Is that, okay, bind. Cool. Is that So that's what you wanted? Yes. And then uh, F on, on the opposite side? F. Cool, that sounds good, right? Because GX has type MB, so the, the little section that we have GX find, which uh, that'll give us type. That's uh, B, to B to MC to MC, right? And so, well, F is exactly of type B to MC, and we get an MC at the end which is exactly what we wanted. Cool. And, and the types kind of told us that's exactly what we had to do. So, so this is, it's very similar to the bind thing, but it's, it's really, it's more symmetric. It's like composition. All right. And now I need to comment this so it doesn't kill my program. So here's what I'm doing. I am reading a file, haskell.txt, which I think has the little <laughs> thing, <laughs> favorite thing. I, I stole that from somewhere else. Though. Yeah, that, I don't even know that's it. from <laughs> some funny kind of rant about programming, just like a fake history of programming languages. That 
Oh, is that how I think it? It says like Wobbler said <laughs> about monadic I.O. All right, so, and then here's two things that we're going to do. So with a file handle, we're going to read this file in two different ways. And so I just have this list that I'm not even really using for the list. I'm just using it to call get car a lot of times, which get car gets the next character from my stream. And so in ML, your type wouldn't be IO string here, right? It would be, it would be IO, uh, it would just be string. And, and so really, right, what we see here, this is, this is the analog of map F composed with map F. So instead of map, I'm using map M, which is the monadic version of mapping. And then instead of the dot, I'm using this composition. And then here, in my read2, I do the map f.f. .f. So, so that's what it would like look like if you were in an ML. Um, and so here it's map m get composed with map m get. And so in In Haskell, when you have composition rate of normal things, not this monadic composition, you get the same answer either way. So let's try this, right? I'm just going to try the first thing and the second thing with that file. So we get very different <laughs> answers there. We can see, essentially, with the read one, we're interleaving, right? We do the map F, and it goes at each point in the list, right, it does a get car and then a get car, or, or, right, it kind of, it does the get car twice on each element of the list. So you get every second thing as the result. The second one does the whole list and then it does the whole list again. And so, right, yeah. See, the first one does two in a row on each element and then the second one does the whole list and then the whole list again. So the second one, we get a whole chunk of like the second half of the piece, where the other one was interleaving the letters. You definitely don't want to optimize the second one into the first one, unless you want gibberish. Oh, I shouldn't have quit out. So any, any questions on any of that stuff? What are you trying to show with this? Just that it's not, you can't do that with map? Yeah, so, so in ML, you wouldn't have these IO types, and you really would be writing like map f dot map f and map f dot f here. Um, that's essentially what you'd be writing. So without typed effects, you can't do that optimization. Okay, okay. Um, and so essentially, you're losing that denotational semantics, that thing that allowed us to procedurally, as humans, like prove that what we proved earlier. It's this it's just the notion that like fx is the same as fx always. If f is const get car and we're just reading these things without the IO types, then get car, you know, at one point it might be Gives you random C stuff, right? and at another point it might be A. It doesn't. It doesn't have the referential transparency. Back to slides. Ah, oh, back to the beginning. Ooh, two of. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do wrong? <sighs> no. I think you tried to optimize. <laughs> how do I? Gosh, how do I? Oh, on the wrong program. I gotta use preview. There we go. And now I'm back in. All right. Is that where? All right. Yeah. Let's let's get to Idris. All right. So, so in Haskell, even. You, what you end up with is there's this awesome curry howard correspondence. So I actually gave a talk on this earlier, and so that means I'm just going to like 
go through it in two minutes now, even though it deserves <laughs> way more of your time. Is, uh, is this the follow-up to that? Because no, we talked about this is not doing a follow-up follow to that one, too. So. <laughs> no, we'll do we can do that in a couple of months. We'll do a yeah, little we'll, follow-up. Yeah, we'll, was that a talk at SLDC or something? Yeah, yeah that was yeah. talking to here, yeah. So. Um, it was actually one of the earlier ones. So the idea is that, essentially, Haskell's type system is a logic. It is. And, and there, there's a really cool correspondence. So let's look at it. Type variables are essentially proposition variables. So they're just abstractly describing a proposition. Types are concrete propositions. So like a proposition is like Socrates is a man. Type, we have a pool. Um, so these both happen to be true propositions in this case. Will we consider true because we can construct something that has that type? So that's our idea of truth in Haskell. Uh, so function types. Well, this is really cool. The arrow in Haskell corresponds totally to implication, which also has an arrow in logic. It makes sense. Tuples are conjunctions. So the idea is, you know, if each type variable tells me whether it's true or not, whether I can make one. If I'm able to make an A and a B and put them into a tuple, right, that means I've proved that both are true. Either allows me to do one or the other of the type, and I have to do one of them. And so that's like disjunction. Uh, and so I probably should have had this earlier, but type inhabitation is what truth is. So if I can make something that has a given type, what I'm doing is I'm proving that it's true. So, so here's a trivially true proposition that if a proposition P is true, then P is true. It's like, that's not the uh, most <laughs> exciting, exciting one, but, uh, and so Haskell kind of tells us why it's true. Right? It's not just an axiom or something like that. It, it says because if I have a proof of A, I can just give you that proof of A back, which is the i function. And as we know, it's the only real thing that works there. Um, that's in tails, right? On the, the yes. Last one? Okay. So, that's, so the fact that there's nothing on the left says, I don't need any to know anything to know that this is true. Mm -hmm. So it's a tautology. So the type is the what, and the value is the why. The value is like, really, it's like a proof. Uh, of those propositions. And in Haskell, you don't quite see it because you can't have values inside your types. In Idris, you see it all the time. Um, and that's what makes Idris cool. Here's a type that I can express in Idris. And it's a fun type. Uh, there's usually a very cool name for, for this type. Um, and it was not known until very recently whether someone could write a program which had this type, essentially. Um, anyone know what this type is called? Fermat's Last Theorem. Fermat's Last <laughs> Theorem, exactly. Um, so, so here it is in English. Here it is in a pseudo-mathematical formulation. And here it is pretty much, I, I can make Idris be happy with this as an interpretation of, of the thing above. Um, this is for Ma's last theorem, and it's like really simple to explain, and it's really easy to write down the type. It's, it's not so easy to write down the program which inhabits the type. But this doesn't actually prove it. <laughs> no, the, certainly just stating it doesn't prove it. And I, there's another. Sorry, that was kind of a joke. There's also there. oh sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's also like, I'm not sure that this is really the type because there's a difference between classical and constructive logic, and so you might have to like throw a few more weakenings of it in there because uh, this is a constructive proof. Right? Maybe we just can't prove essentially we can prove not not this it is, might be more realistic. Mm. Um, so here, here's some here's types that we might see. So Haskell sorting has that type. No, it doesn't. Ah, oh, that's a typo. That sorting does not have that type. And that's oh, yeah. not what, What's the word again? I, it's, 
that's a type class constraint that says that. Oh, okay. So it essentially, must be that type that you give it has be. to come with an understanding of how to compare things. That's either or max or min. Uh, I, I yeah maximum or yeah and it's it re, it should, oh, it's an unsound type in a sense right because you could feed it the empty list and if you feed it the empty list you can't produce an A so but that's a typo it should be list of A anyway the type that I wrote in Idris for my quick sort which um, I will admit took perhaps <laughs> more than a week to write. And, uh, <laughs> A lot of lines of code to to do a pretty simple thing, but Wait, it took you a week to write this right here. I mean, it's not like I was doing it like as my full time right, job. Right, right. <laughs> he was thinking about. Oh no, no, not the type. <laughs> oh, oh, not okay. the type. Oh, the underlying program, the 150. Yes, it's easy to write the the okay, type gotcha. was the first thing, and that's why I'll get to type driven development. Isn't it nice <laughs> to 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 look at this type? It says like, if I've got a type. And I've got a total order on my type. This this part isn't too relevant. It's just describing the pieces of my total order. Um, then I can take a list, and I can produce a list such that the list that I return, this Y's here, is sorted with respect to that total order that I gave it. So if I want, I can give it different total orders, and it'll sort it in different ways. And it's a permutation of my original list. So, so to write this type even, it's a little more complicated than what we saw before. Even to write this type, I had to make data types that said what it means for something to be sorted and what it means for you to have a permutation. Um, I thought I might jump back to... Hey, do you mind if we take a quick break? Uh, sure. I actually would like to get some water. I don't know if anyone else... Is that okay with everyone? Sure. Or? Can you like bring up your 150 lines of code while we're in the break?